Hey, y'all. As Brandon said, my name is Grant Glover, and I am helping out with the high school students now at PCBC, and I'm super excited about that. I've been working with our college and young singles at Off the Clock on Tuesday nights at the Angelica Theater, which has been a blast. And this morning, before I get started, I want to go ahead and read the passage that I'll be preaching from today. It's in Matthew 3. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and take it out or your phone. We'll be in Matthew 3, starting in verse 13, and we'll go all the way through verse uh, 11, chapter 4. So I'm going to read for us, starting from Matthew 3, 13, and follow along if you can. So here we go, Matthew 3, 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is God's word. I figured since I'll be hanging out with high schoolers a lot more now, I'd start off this morning by explaining to you how much of like an oversized child I still am. Because when I was younger, I grew up loving Batman. Batman was my guy because I growing up was on PBS and Cartoon Network watching the Batman animated series. Any fans out there? There we go, come on, shame on you if not. It is one of the greatest cartoons ever made, and I'm willing to fight anybody who disagrees. And it's, this basically walks you through all of Batman's adventures through multiple seasons. And my love for Batman and honestly my nerdiness did not stop there. You get older, go to high school, you start watching all of the weird old movies about Batman, like the George Clooney one with Jim Carrey. It was weird. But then you hit high school and the Dark Knight trilogy comes out. And with the Dark Knight, him and the Joker, you know, the really intense movie, one of the best ever made. I loved it. Could watch it over and over again. And not only that, I also got into the Batman video games, all the Arkham games. Most of you have no idea what it is. That's okay. That's for me. The whole point is I love Batman. So you best believe when the most recent Batman movie came out two weeks ago, I was there opening night in the IMAX at North Park, ready to go because I love Batman. And I'm gonna go ahead and come at all of you haters. Yes, this Batman is Edward from Twilight, okay? Robert Pattinson is Batman, but he's actually good, I promise. And I love this Batman movie because it's a slightly different take on him. And the movie opens with him monologuing and showing scenes of Gotham City and him saying, I've been Batman for two years and I feel like I'm not making a difference. You see, it shows Gotham throughout the whole movie as this gross place to live. There's crime everywhere, people getting robbed, mugged all the time. The city looks gross. Like, who would want to live there? And here's Batman putting on a Batman suit every night for two years, fighting crime, and nothing's happening. And so at the beginning of the movie, he's having this crisis because his lack of progress in the midst of him not sleeping, having no friends, having to wear like eye makeup under his mask, having to go to his cave all the time, is wearing on him and putting his body through turmoil and nothing's happening. 
And he's wondering, am I doing the right thing or am I just wasting my time? And what I like about that so much is that kind of Batman is super relatable to us. Because when you think about it, how often do you feel that you're trying to make progress in life and you feel like all the things you're doing are not making a difference? Like you want to be a better person, a better husband, a better father, a better daughter, a better son, a better parent. But all of these old habits continue to stick around and you keep succumbing to a lot of the same temptations that have been there for a while. Your Gotham City feels like it's not changing. Many of us know what the right thing to do is and we know there are certain sins we shouldn't do. And then we vow, I will never do that again. But then we click on the video that we know we shouldn't. We snap at the people we love in a moment of poor judgment or we do things that we really, really deeply regret. And when that happens, we begin to feel this overwhelming sense of inadequacy. We begin to feel like Batman, is anything I'm going to do actually make a difference? Or am I just too far gone? And I think at least to some level, everybody in the room can relate to that, be it believer, not believer, whatever it is. Because the essential question we're asking today and trying to figure out is, how do we battle old temptations? How do we battle temptations without feeling inadequate when we fail? How do we struggle through life without feeling like trash when we fall down and things aren't going well? And we'll see our answer in the passage I just read for us in Matthew 3 and 4, where Jesus himself over it becomes involved in this struggle. And in this passage, we're going to see three things the way of life, the way of death, and the way of the substitute. So we're first going to look at our passage. We're going to learn what it means about following the way of life. We're gonna first talk about, look at Jesus' baptism and see what it has to say about following the way of life. And so last week we started in Matthew one and we covered his genealogy and we've skipped ahead to Matthew three because in the book of Matthew, this is Jesus' first act of public ministry. And so you see in verse 13 that Jesus comes up to John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and he asks to be baptized by him. And when Jesus makes this request, John immediately recoils. And in verse 14, he says, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? He's basically saying, I can't do this. We ought to do this the other way around. Why? was because of what John believed about baptism. And in the passage before this, he says that he was preaching and delivering a baptism of repentance. And that idea right there, a baptism of repentance, is something that can often get lost in the shuffle in church circles, because oftentimes we talk about baptism as being obedient. God commanded it, therefore we should do it. And that's true. But to John the Baptist and the earliest Christians, baptism was so much more than that. Because what they pictured was that there were two ways of life in the world. There's the way of life and the way of death. And baptism was a proclamation and a pledge to, after you accept Jesus, to follow the way of life. And Jesus is going to show us what we mean by this way of life. If you keep looking down in verse 15, he responds to John, let it be so for now, let me be baptized, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now notice what he's saying. Jesus is not in need of repenting. He does not need to turn. What he is saying is, I have come to die for the sake of my people. I've come to identify with them. So I'm going to identify with them in baptism and I myself am going to show you the way of life by doing this. And I'm going to take on the role of the servant. And that right there, it tells us what we need what we need to know because this is essentially what he's saying. Jesus is saying in his baptism, I am following the way of life and the way of life is submitting to God, not taking my power to advance my priorities, but submitting all of my contentment and priority to him. And that right there confuses people because in a modern 21st century society, we don't typically think of finding life that way because what the gospel says 
is that life is not found in attaching contentment to the things you want around you, but in attaching your contentment to somebody else, to God, to actually submit your wants and needs to what somebody else says is about finding life, not what you say. Many people, end up, what pe- many people end up doing is they, we pursue idols, particularly in America. And what I mean by an idol is we pursue money, fame, power, sex, whatever it is, the things around us that we think will lead to happiness if we attach our lives to them and get as much of them as we want. And what Jesus is saying is at his baptism is, oh no, none of those will lead to anything. The only way to find life is actually to give all of that up. It's only when you stop trying to find your life in your wealth, in your relationships, or in your influence that you actually begin to live the good life. Now, how could that be possible? One of the best explanations as to why chasing after the things around us won't lead to the good life comes from this guy named David Foster Wallace. Now, David Foster Wallace was not a Christian. He was actually an atheist. He was a famous fictional writer, and he passed away a few years ago. But in 2005, he delivered this amazing commencement speech at the graduate, for the graduating class at Kenyon College. And this is what he had to say to the graduating seniors as they were about to enter the real world. He says, there is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for choosing some sort of God is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you'll end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will, nev- you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. That's the point. Wallace understands what Jesus is declaring at his baptism, is that to make your life about not accruing your own happiness that true joy is found is taking your contentment and not attaching it to the things around you that will fail you, but attaching your contentment and sense of life in God who is eternal and unchanging and can deliver on his promises, that there's no emptiness there. And so then that is what we have to see in the midst of our struggle, when we're struggling to be better people, that this Christianity thing is not all about rules and morals and doctrines, what it is about is finding the way of life. That what God has to offer in and of himself is life. And it's found in the unexpected way of actually giving up of things and submitting to him that where life is truly found. And so in the midst of your struggles and the trials, what you have to realize is that you're seeking to find and follow the way of life like Jesus is. Now you may grant me that, or at least understand kind of what I'm saying. But the question is, why is it so hard then to actually commit to that? Because I could get up here and say life is found in God and not in the things of this world, but man, it is really hard to actually commit to that. Why is it so hard? What we're going to see next is that it's because there's something alluring about the way of death and there's someone trying to pull you off of the way of life. And so in our second passage here, the second part of this passage, we're going to talk about fighting the way of death. We're going to see this next. Because in this section, we're going to look at the temptations of Jesus and how he responds to them. So look at chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, After his baptism, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So right after Jesus declares that submission to God is where life is found, Here comes a devil trying to pull him away from that and onto the way of death, away from the way of life. And this morning, I don't have time, because I know some people in the room maybe struggle with the idea of supernatural evil forces existing. If that's you, it's a valid concern. 
I'll be up here at the front and so will others if you want to have, if you have questions about that and want to kind of talk through that, what that means. What I have time to say this morning is that the Bible here is not advocating for finding a devil in every evil thing that happens. Like it's not, what the Bible is not saying here with Jesus being tempted is that if you mess up or fail, then it's the devil's fault. That's because he was there. Like there's plenty of brokenness and sin in all of us for us to make plenty of mistakes without any help needed. But what it is saying is that there is the reality, even though there's not a devil in everything, there are evil spiritual forces seeking to pull you out of the way of life onto the way of death by wanting you to place your contentment in the things that are all around you that are temporary, that are surrounding you every day. But the thing is, is it's not happening in the way you think because many of us assume when we hear spiritual warfare or temptations that it's dramatic, showy, possessions, horror movies with demonic things or big sins. But no, there's a lot more subtlety going on with what the evil forces are doing. And C.S. Lewis helps us understand that in a very famous book called The Screw Tape Letters. This is fictional book he wrote where this older demon was teaching a younger demon how to best tempt somebody. And this older demon says, don't reveal yourself to him. Don't be dramatic, be showy. Just simply nudge him along to think that materialism is the way to go. That all what's going on around him is actually where he's going to find life and happiness. And in a, in a very quotable part of the book, the older demon tells the younger one to get his patient to succumb to the series of just small little sins. Because as he says... It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. That's exactly what they do. While we think temptations are always grand as things like lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, no, what the enemy wants, the easiest way to put you on the way of death is to subconsciously lull you into the sense that my happiness can be found in the things around me. If they can convince you of that, then they've got you. <laughs> so with that being said, that's exactly what Satan tries to do to Jesus. And I want you to look at these three temptations that the devil tempts Jesus with, and it's about self-gratification, self-protection, and self-exaltation. Because the first one we see the devil tempting Jesus with self-gratification. If you look down in verse 3, after Jesus hasn't eaten in 40 days, Satan says, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, is it because bread's a bad thing? No, it has nothing to do with bread being bad. Food is obviously good. What he's doing is he's saying, look, Jesus, you're powerful. You don't need to go through all this hunger. Just, just make the stones into loaves. You can do this. Because what he knows is that Jesus' purpose is he's submitted to God's will that I'm going to become like a normal human. But what Satan wants him to do is take the easy way out, to just fill his momentary desires like that and just... Get rid of that. You don't need that. What's the point? Because the moment you think you can fill your own desires by your own means, you feel like you need God less. And so for us, what that means then is we're going to be tempted to take the easy way out to satisfy our longings with good things in the moment. So for my young friends in the room, that means that whenever you're feeling lonely or isolated, you'll be tempted to simply take out your phone find all the people you're attracted to, and hit them up. Because then you can get that sense of validation right there. Don't turn to God to remind yourself of his validation for you. Just get your phone out. You can do that. Or maybe it's the fantasies beginning to play in your head to get that sense of acceptance, imagining what acceptance would look like. Because those things, relationships are not bad things, but the temptation comes in wanting to pull you from the way of life of, no, God doesn't have what you need. This does. And the more you can think that self-gratification will bring you happiness, the more he's got you on the way of death. 
And then you see the second temptation is about self-protection. If you look at verses five and six, where Satan takes Jesus on top of the temple in Jerusalem, he tells him to throw himself off the cliff and that the angels will catch him. You see that in the next verse. And again, angels saving and catching Jesus isn't a bad thing, but what Satan wants him to do here is to give Jesus a sense of security. That look, if you just jump, watch, God will catch you. He wants him to use the gifts he has around him to give himself a sense of, I'm protected by God. And what this means for us is that while we may not have angels at our disposal, Satan will tempt us with the various things around us, the various gifts we've been given, to try to bolster our own sense of security, to protect ourselves. For example, the enemy wants to pressure us onto the way of death by convincing us that we can be safe and secure if only our 401ks were to just go up. And he wants you to spend more and more time and energy and effort pouring into that. And in fact, he wants you to feel joy when you watch that number go up And even better, he would love for you to keep looking at your phone, refreshing it all the time, checking out how all the accounts are doing. Why? Because the moment he can convince you that that's where life is found, then now you're no longer finding it in God. Again, it's not those those things are bad. Wealth and money are not bad things. But the idea is he wants you to convince those that those are where life is, even though they'll ultimately bring death if that's where your meaning is. The third temptation, finally, is about self-exaltation. If you look at verses 8 and 9, Matthew 4, Satan then takes Jesus to a very tall mountain in a vision and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, all of these I will give you, if only you will bow and worship me now. What he wants Jesus to do is Jesus is the rightful ruler to all the kingdoms of the world, but he has to get there through suffering, dying, and then raising again. And the devil just says, skip the process, cut out the middleman, take the easy way out now. He wants to give Jesus this, use Jesus' sense of power, his ability to make him have status now. And for us, he wants us to use our things and our lives to give us a sense of status now. And he'll do that by suggesting that you deserve more in your relationships. Because this kind of temptation begins when you start thinking or being prodded to think that I deserve to be around the smartest, wealthiest, most good-looking people because I want to build my sense of self. And you begin to look at the people who are around you to boost your sense of who I am. And then everybody in your circles, in your network, just becomes a little tiny dot of someone who's meant to fill your needs. And again, the moment he can convince you that, no, God doesn't have what you need Just have these people in your life and they'll give you your sense of self. Then he's got you on the way of death. Now all of this sounds overwhelming (laughs) because that's what I just said is a lot. And those are all very real things and it can be kind of overwhelming when you look at all of them. How in the world are you supposed to fight all those at once? Well, Jesus shows us the way because you see in the passage how Jesus says to fight the way of death. Because if you notice, as it was read earlier, every time he is tempted, Jesus responds with, it is written. It is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. It is written, you shall worship only the Lord your God. Why does Jesus quote scripture? It's because Jesus is telling Satan and reminding himself that submitting to God is where life is found. In all the things Satan is trying to push, point him towards to find life, he's saying, no, this is what scripture says about life. And, he's, and all of these things that we know about where life is found are found in the words that God spoke. Because Jesus is essentially saying, self-gratification, self-protection, and self-exaltation will not lead to the happiness and joy and contentment we're all looking for. I'm going to put my meaning and trust in God so that I can actually be joyful and I will go to the word to remind myself of that. And that right there is why believers are called to read scriptures. Reading scripture is not about checking a box 
making God pleased with you or acquiring more biblical knowledge. What it is ultimately about is a relationship with him and going there and recognizing this is where life actually is. To remind yourself of the way of life, you have to be in his word because it is so easy to forget. The only way to convince yourself in the midst of all the, the, the temptations you face, in the midst of your struggle, the only way to, that the way of life is worth going on is by constantly looking at the scripture and focusing your mind on the eternal and not the temporary. Because if you never open your Bible, if you're never in the scriptures, it's going to be really hard to be reminded that the things of this world, the things that occupy our attentions most frequently, will not lead to life if that is our only pursuit. So the idea then is because we're like honestly kind of dumb, we have to be in the scriptures a lot. That's the whole point. Because every day I wake up and forget that. Your mind can instantly be taken away from where life is actually found. And this is then the call to listen to what God has to say in his word. And he's saying, here's life. Be reminded of that. Because he knows the way of the enemy is coming at you. And all the things of the world are taking your attention away from him. And he wants you to have that life. So that's how you fight the way of death. By reminding yourself through the scriptures, where is your joy actually found? That's the point. Now, as I say that, some of you may feel a little hopeless because you might be thinking, I never win against temptation. It comes, I'm a goner. I'm too broken. I'm too messed up. I'm not really sure God, God wants anything to do with me anyway half the time. And if that's you, this is where we're going to land to talk about that. Because this brings up our last point, that there really is hope in the midst of your temptations as you're fighting the way of death. There is a way to not feel inadequate. And it's by accepting the way of the substitute. This is our last thing. Look closely at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, where we'll see what it has to say about the way of the substitute. And it says that after Jesus' baptism, and right after God says, I am well pleased with you, it says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Look closely at what it's saying about that then. God said, I am pleased with you. Then God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What that means is that right after Jesus began his public ministry, struggle came. He first got comfort, then he got wilderness. He first got water in baptism, then desert with the devil. He had a voice from heaven speak to him, and then immediately came a voice from hell. And what this shows then, what this shows us is that Jesus entered into the struggle too. And that to enter into the struggle is not a bad thing, it is actually a good thing. Because if you feel like you struggle, that you're not measuring up, that you can't beat the old habits over and over again, and that you're just too bad, then you actually get it. If Jesus struggled, we're going to struggle. Because that's what makes us believers. The more powerfully God works in someone's life, like Jesus, the more the struggle will come in the midst of experiencing being tempted to the way of death. The Christian life is marked by struggle. That's what it is. Between the way of death and the way of life. So I'm more worried about the person who doesn't struggle than the one who does. Because the one who does gets it. This whole life's about struggle. And here's why you don't have to be worried about struggle and why you don't ultimately have to fear occasionally being led to the way of death. Because look, think about the passage again. Jesus was baptized in your place when he didn't need to be. He was tempted in your place when he didn't need to be because ultimately he was the substitute. He substituted himself in our place. And what that means then, if you feel like you're not making a difference, if you feel like your life's a struggle, he empathizes with you because he's been in the struggle. Now, some of you might say, but Grant, he's God. <laughs> Those temptations are pretty easy 
when you're God being able to resist them. And so it can often feel like he doesn't know what we're going through. But he does, because C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He wants you to imagine two people walking through a sandstorm with the wind just beating in their face, sand hitting their eyeballs. And one man continues head first through the wind, never giving up. And the other falls down face flat to avoid the wind and the sand. Who experienced more pressure? The one who kept going. That's Jesus. Because he never failed, he never failed in temptation, he experienced more pressure than we could ever imagine. He was, because he was, God was working so powerfully in his life, he experienced more struggle than we could ever think about. And what that means then is he substituted himself in your place to feel your pain and to know what it's like. So that means then that he's with you, that when you're in your darkness, when you're in the middle of your eating disorder, in the middle of the temptation to reach for the bottle again to numb the pain, or in the middle of wanting to isolate yourself because you just can't be around other people and you just need to be alone, he gets it. He's been there. He substituted himself in the struggle to be with you and to empathize with you in that. But not only that, it's not just that he empathizes. When you think about accepting the way of the substitute, the big point is that what ultimately gives you the real hope in the midst of your struggle is that Jesus substituted himself in our place, living a human life, struggling through the human life, living it out perfectly, and then was crucified on a cross, tortured and died and abandoned, so that you would never have to be judged for your failures. Because he was tempted like us, but didn't fail, because he was actually perfect and he was God, when he dies for you, that means that you can be forgiven and accepted. That God can now, because of what he did as the substitute, can look at all of us and say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, with whom I am well pleased. And not because of anything we've done, but because of what the substitute did. All he asks is that we would accept that way of the substitute. That our struggles and failures no longer define us, he defines us. And when you accept the way of the substitute, when you accept that, when you accept his work on your behalf, your struggles no longer become life-altering or life-shattering. You'll find that struggle is often not always a bad thing. Back to Batman one more time. What made the Batman movie so great, like I said, at the beginning of the movie, he feels like he's not enough, he's inadequate, that he's not doing enough. He's close to, he feels like he wants to quit and give up because what's the point? I'm not making a difference, but what he does is he keeps going. He keeps on putting on the bat suit, sleepless nights, putting his body through turmoil, giving up relationships, isolating himself because the city needed him. And it's the struggle of that, that's what makes a hero. For you, what that means then is that your struggle is what makes you the hero. Nobody would like Batman if his life was always perfect and nothing was ever going wrong. In fact, the reason we think he's such a hero is because he gets his back broken sometimes, he fails, he struggles, he's miserable, but he keeps going. And no matter how many times he gets knocked down, he gets back up. And it is the struggle then that makes people heroic. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He enters the struggle. But what that means then is the struggle of your life no longer defines you no longer takes away meaning in your life, the struggle brings meaning. It brings about something greater when you fight through it. And so that means then in your conflict, when you feel like you're not making progress, when you're fighting through old habits, when you're picking yourself up, when you fail and you do succumb to the way of death, if you trust that Jesus has enough grace for you and you're not defined by that, you can keep going. And what you'll find 
is that having failed and picked yourself back up, something greater comes about because of that. That's not about you being perfect. It's not about you having your life go perfect. It's about accepting Jesus' way of being the substitute and identifying with him in the struggle. Let his struggle define you and not yours. And then you might be Batman. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today and thank you for your word. Thank you that in you and you alone is life. And though I fail and frequently turn away, I know that what you've done defines me, not what I do. And the same goes for everyone in this room. So I pray that this week, in the midst of whatever chaos is going on or just mundane tasks, mundane weeks, things that feel dreary, that we would be reminded that you have life, even when it doesn't look like it. That through the reading of your word this week, in whatever ways we're able to do that, that we would see you more clearly, love you more deeply, and understand what you did for us much more clearly. And take comfort in knowing that the way of the substitute truly has given us all that we need in the midst of our struggle. That you would do something powerful in all of our lives as a result of that. In your name I pray. Amen.